Welcome to Comment with me, George Galloway, here on Press TV, still the voice of the voiceless. Comment is the big conversation. It can even be sometimes the great debate, but that depends on you, because we can't have a debate unless you call me to disagree. And the number is 442086014555. You call us, we'll call you back, establish a clear line, and remember, if you get on the television with me, the volume on your television has to be down at zero. Or I'll have to move swiftly on because no one will understand either of us. Or you could text me on 4478-0000-8066. Or you can email me at comment at presstv.co.uk. Now, what do Alastair Campbell and Zippy Livney have in common? Well, a remarkable number of things. First of all, both of them are extremely close to the war criminal, Tony Blair. Who's more close uh, remains a matter of conjecture. Uh, both of them are professional liars. Uh, Livni was, before entering politics, a Mossad agent of some repute. Or should that be ill repute? They both have a particular interest in pornography. Alastair Campbell, before going to work for Tony Blair in Downing Street, was a pornographic writer in sex magazines. Livney has recently written a book in which she boasts, I kid you not, of having slept with hundreds of people in the course of her life as an intelligence agent. All in the cause, you understand. She even claims, though as a professional liar, you might not want to automatically believe her, to have slept with more than one of the current Palestinian leadership with whom the Israeli government is negotiating in Washington. Uh, I'm not suggesting that Alistair Campbell has slept with the enemy. I know nothing about his actual personal life, just the kind of thing that he writes. No, I don't mean the sex magazines of old, I mean Twitter as anyone who has read his recent ravings can testify. Now, he openly admits to being an alcoholic, uh, a person with mental health problems, and yet he ended up at the Prime Minister's side, at the Cabinet table, indeed even in meetings of the Joint Intelligence Committee, even chairing meetings of the Joint Intelligence Committee in the run-up to the war on Iraq. That means he must have been positively vetted by the British security services. Now, in the past, you needed to have certain uh, tastes and indeed a drink problem to get into the British security services. But one thought in this new era of a middle-class intelligence community that Campbell might fail one or two of the tests, but clearly not, because he was absolutely central to the tissue of lies, the mountain, the tower of lies that was built to justify the war on Iraq, in which well over a million people have now perished. The UN has just stated that 400,000 people have been displaced and are now living as refugees in their own country just from the violence going on in the west of Iraq at this point in time. Another million. Uh, give or take a hundred thousand or two, perished in the war and the violence that the war unleashed. The war and occupation was, of course, an Anglo-American affair. And George Bush and Tony Blair bear a particular responsibility for it. But those satraps who clung around them and did their dirty work will have to face their day of judgment also. And the reason that Campbell has recently slithered into life on Twitter against me is because my Blair documentary is getting rather close for comfort. We're now looking at the strange death 
of Dr. David Kelly. You'll remember him, the British scientist who was mysteriously found in a wood, having allegedly cut his wrists with a blunt penknife and swallowed enough aspirin to, well, put a spider to sleep. And I just want to make this clear, if I'm ever found in a wood, having cut my wrists with a blunt penknife and swallowed a couple of, uh, of uh, neurofens, trust me, it wasn't suicide. Now, that's just one of the subjects. Here are the others. We're asking, as we run up to the Afghan elections, what type of leader does Afghanistan need? There are candidates, foreign ex-foreign ministers and uh, other ex-ministers of the Karzai regime who are in the running for the presidency. But the Taliban uh, are vowing to make sure that the election is wrecked. And they're going to do everything that they can to disrupt it. And, of course, the Western invaders and occupiers of Afghanistan will soon be leaving. That's why Karzai is going to enjoy the rest of his life with his ill-gotten gains. And uh, it won't be long before the Taliban are back in power. So in a way, it doesn't really matter which of the candidates now running for president of Afghanistan should win, because he'll probably end up hanging from a lamppost very soon afterwards. Such are the fruits of Western policy in Afghanistan. Because, of course, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda were introduced to Afghanistan by Western governments in the first place. Afghanistan had a very good government in the 1980s, which sent girls to school and university and nationalized the land and took off the big landowners and tried to redistribute wealth and modernize the country. Britain and America spent billions of dollars and gave a huge armory of weapons to the people who became Al-Qaeda and the people who became uh, the Taliban. So what type of leader, not necessarily which particular leader, does Afghanistan need? That's the second of our subjects this evening. And the third is, why is NATO building up its military in Eastern Europe? President Putin of Russia is furious that uh, NATO is pouring troops into its new allies in Eastern Europe. Of course, encircling Russia, as they are in the US, encircling China. Now, you don't need to be Einstein to work out why the United States, whose neocons, uh, led, of course, by George W. Bush, whom Alistair Campbell thinks was a great guy, a people's man, he called him. But then Blair regarded Diana as the people's princess, you'll remember. Why is NATO poking the Russian bear? Why is it poking a stick in the eye of Russia? Do they actually want war? Are they trying to crank up the very kind of crisis that will take all of our minds off everything else that's happening? And my goodness, so much else is happening. In uh, Greece, uh, this very week, the Greek government, a member of the European Union, banned all rallies and demonstrations on the streets of Athens. Of course, the great Greek people utterly disregarded the ban, and Athens was once again in flames. Crisis, collapse, is taking place in Spain, in Portugal. The French political system is in free fall. Its president has just been utterly humiliated in local elections uh, just in the last few days. And guess what? France has now appointed a new prime minister whose hero, he says, is Tony Blair. Good luck with that, mate. Let's hope you don't do to France what Tony Blair did to Britain. So these are the subjects. If you want to join in, then all you have to do is call as Jamal in Iraq has done. Jamal, welcome to the show, my friend. Uh, thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, really, the topic is so much interesting. Uh, and uh, I will tell you, I'm from Kurdistan. Uh, Kurdistan is a part of Iraq. Maybe we become an independent country. And uh, regarding with the topic that you mentioned earlier, 
Uh, in my understanding, uh, most countries like Iraq as well as Afghanistan, being election in this type of country, it is so much useless and meaningless. Meaningless. There is meaningless. Yes, because there is not authority. Means internal authority, countries' authority there, and. Still, uh, still, it is under Eastern country occupation, occupying. Most countries occupied and colonized by the U- Western country. Either uh, me and you and other one become a leader, it not have any meaning, because already this type of country, it is occupied. Well, uh, I think uh, you've made a very uh, good point, uh, Jamal. Afghanistan, first of all, all, is an occupied country, and the vote is on Saturday. And the foreign forces are still there. Uh, And, of course, Karzai is quitting. Uh, He's running from the wrath that he knows is coming down the road. But he's running off with quite a package, quite a retirement package, quite a golden handshake uh, with which to depart. So Afghanistan would have no leader if there were none elected on Saturday. But you're right, not only is it occupied by foreign invaders, it's also huge tracts of the country are not under the control of the Afghan government or the foreign occupiers, but are under the control of the Taliban. And there won't be any voting going on in those areas, and even in the areas that the Afghan regime thinks that it controls, then the voting will be attacked by the uh, fighters of the Taliban, the very people that we helped introduce to Afghanistan in the first place. It's just another of the success stories of the likes of Bush and Blair, Powell and Campbell and Straw and all the other villains. And uh, I hope, uh, Jamal, in Iraq you see the film that I'm making. Of course, a lot of it centers around Iraq but you'll find one or two surprises in it too. Jamal in Iraq, thanks for that uh, call. We're talking about Zippy Livni, who has just demanded that Netanyahu should cancel the prisoner exchanges with the Palestinians uh, because the Palestinian leaders are not rolling over in Washington in the way that Netanyahu would like. John Kerry, it's reported today, is scrambling desperately to save what he calls, laughingly, the peace process between Israel and Palestine. Of course, it's an endless process without any peace, and the price of the occupation is rising daily. The starvation that's occurring in Gaza, the endless killing of Palestinians on the West Bank, as well as in Gaza, and the agony of Jerusalem, now illegally annexed and being ethnically cleansed. So that's also on the agenda tonight. Let's go to the United States, to Chicago, to talk to Mahar on the Afghan question. Mahar, welcome to the show, my friend. How you doing, George? By the grace of God, I'm good. Go ahead, please. Uh, regards to the regards to the military buildup in Eastern Europe. Yes. Okay. Don't forget that uh, right now we have a, a, a war with two phases of a new world order going on. One is military, and one is financially and uh, economically. In regards to the buildup, uh, don't forget that Russia is one of the backbone to the BRICS organization, okay, which is uh, another superpower and could be uh, threatening as far as to the New World Order. Now let's just uh, explain, Maha. BRICS means Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Those are the BRICS countries. Of course, being joined all the time uh, by new uh, people with uh, new countries with observer status. Go on, Maha. Okay, that's because that's part of the economical. Okay. The military is the superpower. By Russia being a superpower, uh, they're trying to corner Russia and surround it to uh, uh, to avoid the dollar being on the deathbed, which is on, right now it's on a uh, do-or-die mission as far as the uh, economical and military. 
phases of that war. Well, good points, Mahar. Uh, I've said here before, I don't know why China, which holds more U.S. dollars than the U.S. does, continues to tolerate the provocations that the United States is mounting, not least against them. I don't understand why Russia and China and other countries don't uh, themselves introduce a new currency, a new reserve currency, uh, and leave the dollar in the lurch. After all, it's not exactly backed by any real wealth, and the United States economy, apart from its military uh, hardware and its military industrial complex, is on the floor. Now, we're talking, of course, about the Afghan elections, the strongest candidates, are uh, Abdullah Abdullah, so good they named him twice. He's an ophthalmologist and a former foreign minister of Afghanistan. Ashraf Ghani, uh, who was educated at Berkeley, at the University of California. That sounds like a good qualification to be the president of Afghanistan. And Zalmai Rasul, who is Karzai's candidate. That's his chances. Uh, just gone down the tubes. Uh, Unless, of course, the voting has already been counted before it has started. which sounds to me quite likely. But it won't make any difference because whoever wins on Saturday, I promise you, will not be president for long. Farouk is in London. Let's hear what he wants to say. Farouk, welcome to the show, my friend. Uh, uh, Salaam alaikum, George. Walaikum salam. Thank you very much for calling. Go ahead, okay, sir. So to do with uh, the build-up against uh, the, of NATO forces um, that was Russia. Yes. Uh, you know, I'd like to refer to um, the, uh, the talk that, um, you know, the ex-UK um, ambassador to, to, to America, Green, he said, like, you know, um, must be crazy to think that uh, any, any war with Russia uh, uh, will be a good thing. Um, is it that he knows something that we don't? Well, it, it would be the end of the world, Farouk. It, it would be. It's not, I mean, it couldn't get much more uh, serious. If Russia is attacked, it will use its thousands of nuclear weapons, and uh, there'll certainly be no more additions of comment. Uh, we will be eviscerated. Human life will come to an end on the planet. So what exactly are these people playing at? What do they hope to achieve? Do they think that Putin is Yeltsin? Do they think uh, that uh, he's uh, some kind of pathetic drunkard who's going to roll over and cry Uncle Sam? They obviously don't know Putin if that's what they think. So these are very, very high stakes, Farouk. Yes, I mean, all this... uh you know, this nonsense about uh, creating democracy in, in Ukraine and all that. There's a lot of double standard that we know it all right around the world. You know, well, uh, is, is it that, uh, yeah, I don't know really, you know, what's behind... Uh, well, what's how can, behind yeah, but I mean, how can they even, how can they even, with a straight face, talk about democracy in Ukraine? The Ukrainian government was overthrown by a mob which set fire to the presidency would have set fire to the president if they could have got their hands on him. MPs were threatened with death unless they voted in a certain way by a mob led by Nazis, openly anti-Semitic, openly Nazi right-wing forces. And how can we describe that as democracy? It doesn't matter that the Ukrainian president was a schmuck a corrupt, incompetent schmuck. He was. But that doesn't mean you can describe a mob overthrowing him as being democracy, at least not by the lights of Western rhetoric normally. After all, Yeltsin was loved because he was a drunk, corrupt schmuck. That's the kind of leader they normally like to be ruling other countries the better that we can steal their things. So whatever else has emerged in the Ukraine, there's nothing democratic about it. And of course, the first action of the new revolutionary power in Kiev was to abolish the Russian language. 
making the 47% of Ukraine, which is Russian-speaking, much of it ethnic Russian, rather nervous, as you can imagine. Now, the idea that Russia has no legitimate interest in these events is utterly preposterous. The Spanish ambassador was dragged into the Foreign Office this week in London and given a good talking to because a Spanish ship entered our territorial waters which happened to be in Gibraltar, which is part of Spain, a rock sitting on the end of Spain. Britain believes it has the right to lecture Spain about the movements of Spanish ships in waters around Spain, but doesn't believe that Russia has a right to be concerned for the fate of 47% of the population of the Ukraine who are ethnically Russian or Russian-speaking people. Farouk, thanks for the call. We're talking also about Iraq. This month, 500 people lost their lives, and that doesn't include the unknown number who have lost their lives around Fallujah and Ramadi and the western Iraqi area, which remains, and I'm not making this up, under the governance this evening of Al-Qaeda. The Al-Qaeda flag is flying over Fallujah, the very same Fallujah that British and American soldiers pulverized and fired gas into in order to wipe out resistance to them during their invasion and occupation. Al-Qaeda, oh my God, they're behind me. What a sight. What a, oh my goodness, I don't know which one to punch first. Now, the Iraq uh, subject uh, continues. All these years since these maniacs invaded and occupied it, people are losing their lives and blood is flowing like a river in Iraq. And they tell us that it was all for the good. Not that anyone's listening to that anymore. Uh, you could fit the entire population of those who continue to support the invasion and occupation of Iraq into this studio and still have room for an elephant or two. Baz is in Los Angeles in the United States. Let's hear from him. Baz, go ahead. Hi, George. Great to talk to you. Uh, I have great respect and admiration for you. Uh, Thank I hope you, God Bob. gives you the strength to continue your work. Thank you so much. I um, want to talk about uh, Russia a little bit. Um, yeah and uh, specific about the NATO buildup of troops in uh, the Eastern Bloc, the Baltics, and now from what I see in the news in the Caucasus. Yes, in the Caucasus um, also, yes. To me, it seems this is just a, a really immature act of desperation on the part of the United States because they've been outplayed by Russia, they've been outplayed by Putin, and really the, the center of the issue around Ukraine was and has always been uh, Crimea, uh, because the United States, as part of its long-term strategy, wants to raise a U.S. flag at the naval base at Sevastopol and ba basically annex the Black Sea like it has the Persian Gulf. And the reason for that is, uh, I'm sure you know this, is because of the oil that uh, U.S. and British oil companies want to extract from the Caspian Basin, specifically from Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, and Turkmenistan, which may to together have as much oil and gas as Iran and Iraq combined, uh, which needless to say would be a very lucrative endeavor for uh, Western oil companies. But the only way to get that oil out currently, the cheapest way is south through Iran, and uh, the way they're currently moving it out is west through Russia. But, um, uh, you know, the other alternative is to move it out through pipelines in the Black Sea and bypassing Russia and Iran completely. And in order to do that, you know, the United States needs to get a foothold on the Crimean Peninsula first. You know, and it's, uh, I wouldn't say that, uh, you know, in the media here, they've been uh, calling Putin unpredictable and uh, uh, an emperor. Uh, it's none of that. I mean, this has always been about Crimea. Well, look, I'll uh, tell you what, Baz, uh, that's the best call uh, for many a week. And I'm really grateful to you for making it. 
from Los Angeles. And I cut you short only because I have to take a short break now for a brief news bulletin. God willing, I'll be back in three minutes. We're talking about Alastair Campbell and Zippy Livni, about Iraq, about Afghanistan, and about Russia. Don't go away. I'll be right back. Welcome back to Comment with me, George Galloway, here on Press TV, still the voice of the voiceless. We're talking about Russia. We're talking about Afghanistan. We're talking about Zippy Livni and Alistair Campbell. And we're talking about the situation in Iraq, which has become an ocean of blood yet again. 400,000 people, according to the United Nations, have been displaced in their own country. Uncountable numbers of them have been killed. Al-Qaeda now occupies Fallujah, and Western Iraq is under the flag of Al-Qaeda, the very Al-Qaeda that we are assisting in Syria, the very Al-Qaeda we've been fighting for the last 10 years, the very Al-Qaeda that we were told we had to sacrifice so many of our ancient liberties for. Oh, I mean, I just don't have enough time in this show to explore all these double standards, all these crazed, absolutely crazed irrationalities. Mohammed is in Birmingham. He might be able to help us. Why is NATO building up its military in Eastern Europe? Mohammed, welcome to the show. Hi, George. How are you? Welcome, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Basically, George, I just want to go with the simple, precise words. I might be out of the bound of the question, but I want to explore the concept by stating about the concept of NATO. The of thing what? is, about the concept of NATO, why NATO is in Eastern Europe. Yes, indeed. Well, uh, it's, uh, it's much farther afield than that. The North Atlantic seems to have uh, expanded across the whole world. The thing is, George, you need to just concede that people just need to open their eyes. This is just the policy of America. Just consider we're out with the nuclear power. I'm just going out of the bound, but I will come. I will make a relevant consideration of this. Look, Iran is having nuclear power. America says it's a threat to the world. Wherever anyone having any power for their own defense, America goes, there's a threat to the world. And they try attacking. I have a question. Why America is having 761 military bases around the world, around the globe? Basically, America, what they're trying to do, they're trying to expand their network around the world as much as they can. And listen, I'm saying on record, in the future, whenever there's going to be a war, it is going to be due to American policy, American policies. They're just trying to con have a control around the world so that whenever there's a fight, they could just be the winner of the, of, of, of well, the war. Well, to my uh, astonishment, Mohammed, uh, I spoke at a school in the week in Royslip in outer London, right next to the Royal Air Force uh, base uh, of Northolt. To my astonishment, there were quite a number of American kids in the school. And they were the children of American service personnel because there's an American air base in London. I never knew that before. Call me stupid. I probably should have known, but I didn't. These bases on our soil are, of course, a clear and present danger to us given the policies of the United States and the enemies that the United States is willy-nilly making for itself. And as you say, 761 military bases of the United States string around the entire globe. The United States has invaded 50 countries in the last 50 years. That's five zero countries in five zero years. Thanks, Mohammed. Jacob is always worth hearing in London. Jacob, welcome to the show, my friend. Hello, good evening, Mr. George Galloway. Good evening, the sir. Voice of the Voiceless, how are you? Thank you. By the grace of God, I'm good. Thanks. I want to, I want to talk about uh, this uh, situation between Russia and NATO. 
Yes. Um, it's very obvious, and I don't understand why some people are still sleeping. Uh, what is the intention of NATO of wanting to be in um, Eastern Europe, and why they want to surround Russia? Simply, they want to be in a position of power where they can control and militarily the situation um, for a planned attack that they have got against Russia. That is the only reason that NATO wants to be there. And the whole idea of them uh, being in Ukraine and wanting to create this situation in Ukraine and going on about Ukraine is simply because it is just a pretext. They want to use, use those pretext to gain more uh, ground, to get more near to Russia, the same as they're doing what in Syria to get more close to Iran. Um, they just want to cripple any kind of uh, uh, power, any kind of uh, uh, effort that Russia or Iran want to make in supporting themselves, in protecting themselves. They want to cripple those, uh, they want to chop off those hands and legs. That's what they're trying to do. Now, so Jacob, uh, the a previous body. exchange between you and I uh, has made it into the Israeli press. I see uh, on my, uh, uh, my Google alert just an hour or two ago uh, that our conversation about Ukraine uh, has made it into uh, the Israeli uh, newspapers and also caused the spectator to call on the conservatives and liberal democrats to stand down in my parliamentary constituency of Bradford West to allow only one mainstream candidate, as they put it, to stand against me, the better to ensure my defeat. So, Jacob, just goes to show the enemy are always watching. Thank you for that call, as always. Let's go to the US, to Barry in Pennsylvania. What type of leader does Afghanistan need, Barry? Yes, uh, Mr. George. Hi, Mr. George. Good show. Thanks. I'm from Afghanistan, Mr. George. Oh, yes, and, uh, uh, that's very interesting. Tell me what you think about Saturday's uh, vote. Afghanistan is going to be never going to be come peace because the Saudi, the Saudi is devil. The Saudi is evil. They, they help Al Qaeda, Saudi. They destroy Syria. They destroy Iraq. All is from Saudi. The longer Saudi is power in Al Qaeda, going to be everywhere. If, if we defeat the uh, uh, government of Saudi, we're going to be. Good. Another voice is going to be for or for a long, long time in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, never going to come peace. In Syria, Iraq, a lot of places. Saudi is the devil, is the evil. Thank you, Mr. George. You give me a chance. I appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Barry. Thank you, uh, President Bye. Obama, of course, was in Saudi Arabia this week. And uh, he met the king. Uh, and the... A journalist asked President Obama at the end uh, if he had raised the issue of human rights, freedom, liberty uh, with the Saudi king. And I'm not making this up. President Obama's answer was that there had been no time to discuss these matters in the two-hour meeting with the Saudi king. Now, uh, that doesn't surprise me uh, because I'm sure that the two-hour meeting was about quite different things than the liberty of the people living in Arabia. And I think we both know, Barry, uh, what those things were. Let's go to Tehran, talk to Mustafa. Mustafa, welcome. Hello. Yes, Mustafa, go ahead. Good evening, good evening, George. How are you, my friend? By the grace of God, I'm good. Thanks very much. Go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, George, my opinion is uh, Afghanistan is uh, semi-independent uh, now, uh, so need a person, a weak people of uh, Afghan for her to be independent and uh, stop influence of influence of uh, foreign countries, especially America and NATO. So uh, with the help of the people, uh, people of Afghan build independent Afghanistan and don't let to some of the foreign company, uh, country interfere in Afghanistan. So political influence America should be interrupted and the cut. Well, I, I'll tell you what I think, and we'll see. We'll see what uh, happens. 
Uh, whoever is elected on Saturday will not be president for long. Uh, he will most probably, unless he can flee, uh, die uh, soon. So I wouldn't take out life insurance. Uh, uh, I wouldn't give out life insurance on an Afghan president elected on Saturday. That doesn't mean I've, that the Taliban will rule, govern the entire country. They won't. Uh, what we will revert to is the pre-Taliban situation, uh, but post Najibullah situation, whereby armed gangs uh, of all kinds uh, will rule their own fiefdoms as warlords, with the Taliban being the biggest and most important of the warlords. I think the Taliban will probably accept that it cannot have its writ running in the entirety of the state. But in the areas uh, where the Taliban are strongest, they already are in government. Uh, not just during the night, although they are governing during the night, more or less everywhere except downtown Kabul, the congestion charge area of downtown Kabul, uh, but during the days also. And I believe that the Taliban and other warlords will simply parcel out poor Afghanistan, who've been punished twice. They were punished because we sent bin Laden and his gang there in the first place, and punished a second time because bin Laden and his gang were there. That's justice, Western style. Parkson is in Nigeria, but wants to talk about NATO and Russia. Parkson, in Nigeria, welcome. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. Yes. Yes, you're on the air. Go on. Thank you very much. You're yeah, welcome. Uh, what Speak is up. happening in the eastern world between the NATO and uh, the government of Russia is so disturbing. It's so disturbing because in this 21st century, all this problem we are having here, there, and everywhere is not supposed to come in. Because we have come to a stage in this war that we are talking about peace. But the military are, you know, building uh, bases in all this area. This military bases, will it serve any useful purpose? Is this factory? Do we benefit from all these military interventions? These are things that we need to consider very well. We have come to a stage. We are talking about peace. How will peace come when everybody has a pistol, when everybody has arms? When well, uh, uh, look, I'll tell you what. Uh, it, it, it's fanciful, to, uh, it's, it's, it's fanciful to wish for peace. Uh, the best we can hope for at the moment is the absence of war. Uh, but the Western provocateurs who are encircling Russia, encircling China, are taking very big, indeed terrifying, risks. Anything can happen on these borders where the Russians are mobilizing inside their own country, uh, their own armed forces, because foreign armies are mobilizing just outside their borders in the former uh, Soviet states, uh, now members of NATO. And uh, this is a, a provocative and reckless and dangerous strategy. And our leaders are leading us into it. And our media is so supine that it cannot even host a discussion about the wisdom of that. Parkson in Nigeria, thanks. I'm going to Wales to talk to Mel about Afghanistan. Mel, welcome. Okay. Hi, yes, go George. ahead. Hi, George. I'd just like to say, uh, mine is a human point about the victims of Afghani and Iraqi illegal wars. And yep. I feel so sad. There's no face or no name to these victims. You know, we hear about um, the, the names of the British foreign forces, American foreign forces who were killed in these countries, which is sad enough. But what about the poor people who are often called ragheads? It really distresses me and we never hear of them. And it really, really saddens me. Well, you're absolutely right. No one's going to hold a minute's silence or 
encant their name hypocritically at Prime Minister's question time when David Cameron promises that he will and we will never forget the names of the fallen British soldiers that he's about to read out. The truth is that if you asked him as he was leaving the chamber 30 minutes later to name just one of the armed services that he's just been saying he'd never forget, he would not be able to do so. But no one's even pretending that the 500 slain in Iraq in the last four weeks, never mind the uncounted, uncountable number, slain in Iraq in the Al-Qaeda-controlled west of the country, never mind the hundreds of thousands, maybe more than one million, depending on whose estimation you accept. No one will ever know the names of those who were slaughtered as a result of these criminals that were just on my wall. And Mel, your poignant point is well taken by me. Thanks very much for making it. Uh, let's talk to Abu Oreira. I probably got that wrong. Abu Oreira in Belgium. Abu Oreira, thank you very much for ringing. Sorry if I got your name wrong. Go ahead. No, you, you call it, you mention it exactly how it was. MashaAllah. Yeah, good evening, sir, Mr. George. Good evening, sir. It's nice having, having me on, the, on your show. Thank you. I'm grateful, and uh, may Allah Almighty continue to bless you for the good job that you are, you are doing. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, i like to talk about uh, our European leaders. Mm. over the Crimea crisis. What, in my opinion, I realized that uh, it was Americans who are trying to, to, to create a problem between, between Russia and, uh, and the Europe. They are, and it's yeah. Europe that will pay the first price for it. Exactly, exactly, because they are trying to push them to do something that it, 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 it was we who will be the first victim. Indeed, so we're uh, already the first victims, uh, even uh, of the exactly. economic sanctions. The uh, economic sanctions will hurt the European Union countries, France, Germany, and Britain in particular, uh, far more than they'll hurt Russia. And if those sanctions become more severe, uh, then the impact on a European Union, which is already on its knees, already in flames in Athens, already on its back in Spain and Portugal, uh, will multiply. And of course, if war breaks out, brother, the war will be in this theater first and foremost. Thanks for that wonderful call and your kind words. Let's go to Tanzania and talk to Saif Adin. Saif Adin in Tanzania, welcome. Go ahead. Okay. Yes, you're on yeah. the air. <clears throat> Hello? Yes, you're on the air. Go Hello. ahead. How are you? Uh, I, first, first of all, I, I, I would like to admire your depth, you know, uh, re, re, con condemning the Saudi, Saudis and, and also the Bear and Campbell. Campbell and your views your, your are all consistent, you know, when you went. Regards the NATO and uh, Russia. Yeah. So if if it, if, if they are so so consistent, I I I I I I I I'm, I'm in I'm, I'm in doubt. You know why 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 is it why is it they are, they are not not not. Uh, well, uh, look, Sefadin, the British Deputy Prime not, Minister, not, 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 the, 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 British, the British Deputy Prime Minister said on television last night about Crimea, you can't go grabbing chunks of countries based on a historical connection. He's obviously never heard what happened to a country called Palestine. He didn't even understand the irony of what he was saying. Let's go to Yaw in London. Yaw, welcome. Go ahead, please, you're on the air. Hello. 
Yes, go ahead, sir. Quickly, we're only a few minutes left. Yeah, Joe. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, just quite quickly. Yeah, um, uh, it, it's just about uh, the problem at uh, at uh, at Ukraine regarding Russia and the and the and the, and the states. Uh, my my view is is simply this: it is just an opportunity for them to complete the circuit and circumvent of all the countries around there, which they particularly want to take out if they get the opportunity, Iran, Russia, China. And to even tell Russia to pick their, their troops within their own borders, away from a, a legitimate military exercise, mm. whilst you are massing troops on their border, it's, it's even my mind boggling. I can't just you know, get my head around that. Well, and, look, uh, uh, the, the United States has uh, military forces in Saudi Arabia, it has its biggest military base in the world in Qatar, both of them in the Persian Gulf, both of them pointing their weapons at Iran. Turkey, under Erdogan, as under the junta before him, is a loyal member of NATO. And therefore, Iran's encirclement, Iraq's encirclement, are both complete. China is encircled, and indeed the United States Air Force and Navy are currently in the South China Sea probing China's exclusion zone in its own territorial waters. The encirclement of Russia has been going on apace since the beginning of the uh, Putin era. They didn't bother when Yeltsin was in. They were too busy stealing Russia's wealth at that time. They have recruited and are seeking to recruit all the countries around Russia into their nuclear armed military alliance. They are encircling any country and subverting any other that in any way might one day be in a challenge to their hegemony, which they helpfully rolled out for us in the project for a new American century. The neocons are still in power, at least in foreign policy, in the United States. Obama's following a policy in Ukraine set for him by John McCain, the guy that he defeated in a landslide election victory. But McCain is setting all the foreign policy uh, of the United States. Kerry is in a race with Hillary Clinton for the Democratic Party nomination. And he and she are outdoing each other in showing how warlike, how like the neocons they can possibly be. Now let me finish by talking about Iraq, which matters a very great deal to me. One million people have been laid in the ground as a direct result of the Bush, Blair, Powell, Campbell, Straw invasion and occupation. One million people. And that's not ancient history. I'm not talking about 10 years ago. I'm talking about today. 500 died in the last four weeks. Hundreds of thousands of Iraqis are tonight living in tents as refugees in their own country. And the black flag of Al-Qaeda flies over some of Iraq's great cities. Really, it is a very big crime. Hello, please comment in the name of the yeah, I know, I know. You, 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 you,